John Stockwell is one of our good friends and a firm fixture on alternative views. I'm sure you know John by now. He was a former CIA high official for 12 years, quit the CIA and wrote a very famous informative book, In Search of Enemies. Well, he's a full-time writer now, and he is on his novel writing experience, and one is just coming out. John, what's the name of it and what's it about? Well, my second book is Red Sunset. It's uh, a story about some American oil company people in a small African capital, about the woman principally, and uh, the adventures she gets into, which includes a chess match, a love story, a uh, terrorist kidnap attempt, uh, which is the vehicle. But really the purpose of writing the book was to try to discuss what it's like our enemies, our detractors, accuse us of being imperialists and being involved in neocolonialism. And it's always fascinated me because I've lived the life that they call neocolonialist uh, in, the, in the big villa in a newly independent country with several servants and shiny new cars and jet planes here and there, while most of the people in the country uh, have very little uh, to survive, to live off of. And so this is the story. I, I wanted to write a story about ordinary Americans who live that kind of a life and what, what the life is all about. Well, John, to start off, let's look at the CIA under the Reagan administration. What are some of the most significant occurrences vis-a-vis -vis the CIA under Reagan? What has he done in his, terms of his policies that have affected the CIA? Well, the, the Reagan election, when he came into office, uh, there was great joy and dancing in the halls of the CIA. They recognized that they would be set back into full-fledged uh, full uh, activities, uh, much like they were at the height of their powers in the 50s and 60s. Uh, and, and that euphoria has pretty much continued. Uh, I, I have not been inside the building, obviously, but I have had a couple of conversations with people uh, who were, and uh, without telling me anything of any substance, they did. Their voices were 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 crowing and and gloating about uh, how the, the world was being righted in their mind, and they were out there defending uh, national security and freedom in all kinds of places, as the CIA has done. And, Chile and Angola and Nicaragua and elsewhere for so many years. They announced on October the 1st that they're going to literally double the size of their new headquarters, the CIA, which would indicate that they're obviously planning many more activities and an expansion of their entire operations. What are some of the evidence of an expanded CIA under Reagan? Well, of course, uh, you know, I, 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 I was kidding. I was up in Washington recently, and I was getting so many invitations uh, to go and lecture that I was uh, I was kidding and saying that I had something that would go on forever because I'm the last whistleblower. Because they've got the court orders and injunctions and the, the Supreme Court rulings, and now the names of agents bill going through, and there won't be all of which is to say that we probably will never know for sure what they're doing now under Reagan, because they are succeeding in getting in a de facto official secrets acts. So the, the American public and the victims will never know the true stories of the current activities like the war in Angola, the pre-Vietnam CIA covert action, the Chile coup, the assassinations. They will be muzzled probably forever, so we won't know for sure. What you hear about uh, are the occasional, it, you know, it's an organization that will always go around shooting itself in the foot because it deals with activists who are trained to, to break the law, who have activist instincts, and they will always be getting themselves in trouble. And what we're really seeing now are gross blunders and gross missteps, and in one case where two agents went so far afoul of propriety in the law that it did erupt into the public view. That's Turpel and Wilson who Turpel covered and Wilson. on 60 Minutes and a PBS documentary. What is Those it? are the ones who helped, were helping Libya, right? Incredible. If, if you can believe it, at ex I, the, the, look at the way our president is dealing with the Libyan problem and Gaddafi, our country so concerned uh, with the terrorism, uh, the hitman team that was supposed to be tracking our president down to kill him, 
And now we find that two fairly senior CIA officers were out actually training. They had, re they had resigned from the CIA, but they were being supported by people who were at the very top of the CIA, who, who it's not clear, and of course <laughs> it may never come clear exactly to what degree they were being supported, but they were being met, debriefed, and assisted in some ways by people like Ted Shackley, who was, who was a, a top CIA, he was chief of the Latin America Division, chief of the Far East Division, and then assistant deputy director of operations. Now, what were these men doing? They were making millions of dollars selling CIA terrorist equipment, expertise, and actually training uh, Libyans, selling this equipment to Libya, and actually training terrorists in the Libyan China Lake terrorist training camp. Now, as the story is, is being squeezed out in bits and pieces, it's coming out, it's now been documented that there were active duty special forces officers uh, helping them to train terrorists inside Libya. Now we're talking about up until 78, 79. And there were also CIA active duty personnel at China Lake training terrorists. And uh, it, this even boggles my mind, having been inside and, and from what I've seen. But all of the, all of the to-do we're making about terrorism, and here we are, deliver, here our CIA is, delivering technology and actually training Libyan terrorists. This sort of uh, illustrates your thesis in uh, of search for enemies that the function of the CIA is to cause problems that makes it possible for military intervention. So that would fit into this sort of scenario that you've drawn. Indeed, and there's no other real explanation for it. Now, one, one of the CIA officers who was still in the CIA, uh, he denied at first association with them. They were claiming that he had supported them. He denied it. And uh, then when, it, when, it was, uh, when he had to admit or perjure himself, he had to admit that there was association. Uh, he, he claimed that it was only to keep contact so they could tell him what the terror, who the terrorists were and what they were doing. Therefore, it was a legit, legitimate CIA enterprise. But then when the, when the Senate tried to squeeze out and the Justice Department documentation from the CIA, there was none. And he said that was because it was something that he was keeping in his vest pocket. So either we have a full-fledged CIA operation or we have an illegal, venal, corrupt operation. But either way, there was complicity with these people who were training and, and making the Libyan terrorists a great deal more, more effective. Now, mind you, we're talking about millions of dollars. We're talking about... The, the latest in terrorist, uh, you know, explosive devices and, and the way you can make an ashtray into an explosive device so when a bad guy puts out his, or a good guy for that matter, puts out his cigar, it blows up and kills everyone in the room, you know, this sort of thing. Well, isn't there, th this seems even more incredible from a couple points of view. One is the fact that maybe it's a super Machiavellian thing that the CIA and the FBI need to have terrorists in the world to justify their increased... Uh, um, money for appropriations. For instance, when uh, the CIA made their latest report, they indicated that there were 3,336 terrorist attacks during the previous year. Now, Alexander Haig didn't think that was enough, so he sent the report back to the CIA, said, give me more terrorist attacks, so they, they upped it to uh, almost 6,000. Uh, this... Yeah, then, uh, then the other aspect of this is that the CIA has historically had a close relationship with the Israeli secret police, the Mossad. And yet the Mossad and the uh, Libyan government and their secret police were mortal enemies, supposedly. So what's going on here? Well, on the one hand, the CIA purist would argue that we have an intelligence requirement to provide information to our government about terrorists and terrorist organizations about the world. And therefore, the only way you can get this information is to penetrate terrorist organizations, get your people inside so they can tell you what's being done. The other side of that is, is very much in the direct... And, and on the first argument, you would, you would try to have contact with Mossad and with the Libyans and with the PLO and with the Red Brigade, anyone you could. And the KGB. And the KGB uh, to, to gather information about them. That's the purest, purest argument. But how... Can you explain this provision of, of, of shiploads of terrorist equipment to the Libyans 
and training by active duty special forces and active duty CIA officers. Now that's, that's where it gets so Machiavellian, it, it blows your mind. And there's no way you can justify delivering the equipment to them in order to gather information about who they are. That's not necessary to gather intelligence. And the only answer is that a little bit of both, that you have an organization that functions in a troubled world. It gets more money and more opportunity. As, like you say, Hague wants 6,000 terrorist bombings last year, not 3,000, because it's more dramatic and he can get more mileage out of it. The CIA, by the same token, would like to have a, a more troubled world because they're, they have more to do. The president and the Congress and the press and everybody are are relying on them and giving them their carte blanche more in a troubled world than in a peaceful world. Uh, but then the other thing that has raised its head, not the first time, but, but so ominously in this Wilson Turple thing, is, is individuals doing it for gain, for millions of bucks. Let's face it, someone in the CIA who's commanded wars around the world uh, it sent people off to die, which, you know, which is the ultimate ego trip for a Pentagon type of person is the ultimate power that a human being can have is to send other humans off to die. Not sentence one individual to the gas chamber, but send 5,000 off to die. Well, take someone who's been at the top of the CIA and he's been doing this secretly and, and uh, commanding forces in the world, manipulating governments, and then he hits a certain age of maybe 50 or possibly 60 if he goes the whole route, and then he retires on 20,000 a year. And it just, you know, it just isn't comfortable, it doesn't work. Now, some of these people have managed to, to retire comfortably, like Bill Colby, the for, former director, and uh, Dick Helms, the former director, by becoming agents of foreign governments and so declaring themselves to our, our Justice Department and getting a salary from the Iranian government or the Japanese government or elsewhere. And people down the line have done the same sort of thing. Vernon Walters is now doing Vernon that, Walters. getting hundreds of thousands of dollars consulting for Guatemala, Argentina, Chile, etc. Yeah, and Vernon Walters was who? The deputy director of the CIA. When I was in, he was the deputy director over me. I and was, was Nixon's uh, White House man, too. Yeah. Um, so selling themselves as agents of foreign governments to sell their expertise and contacts that they gathered in their CIA careers. And then you have these guys, it's now surfaced, and it's, it's an obvious, uh, it's a documented fact, have been selling uh, technology, terrorist technology, to the Libyan government. Meanwhile, our government is not moving against the Vernon Walters or the Dick Helmses or the Bill Colbys, uh, who, who have become agents of foreign governments, but they're suing John Stockwell for writing a book to the American people to tell the truth about what's going on. And they're trying to pass a bill that would make it illegal for any publication to publish the names of any CIA agents. How does this constitute but, a threat to freedom of the press? But mind you, this yeah. bill is it's justified on the basis of the revelation of names. But the bill goes far, far beyond names. It, it says names of secret agents or the activities of secret agents that could draw attention to them. Now, this means, for example, let's take some things that the CIA has done. A uh, secret agent kicks in your door and rapes your wife. Now, if you went out and wrote an article about that and published it in the paper, both you and the editors of the paper, even if you didn't name him, you just said, Mr. X, working for the CIA, kicked in my door last night and raped my wife. That would be a felony under this law. And the debate in Congress on this law, some of the critics, and there are some fortunately, but not enough, said, wait a minute, the way, this thing, the way I read this proposed bill, if the London Times published an article about a CIA escapade somewhere, uh, the New York Times could not reprint the London Times article without committing a felony. And the sponsors of the bill stood up and roared, that is right, we want to stop all of this uh, talk about the CIA. So what we have here, by the sponsor's own admission, is an official secrets act, and a, and a very strict one, one that will cover anything they want to cover up. They classify it and claim it has to do with secret agents' activities. My book could never be published. The, the CBS and PBS uh, stories that you mentioned on, on Turple and Wilson could not be published. It would be a felony. Many of the 60-minute shows would be felonies. So this provides a cover of secrecy 
for the CIA of the broadest possible sort. For the first time in our history, freedom of speech has been, uh, is being, now it hasn't passed yet, although the nose count is that it will go sliding right through Congress right now, but for the first time in our history, the secret police of the government are being gi given legal precedent over freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Now, mind you, they've bludgeoned people before and punished people before, such as myself and Frank Snepp and, and Phil Agee and Marchetti for, for attacking, for criticizing the, the CIA. But they've done that in the civil court, but now it will be a felony to, to criticize the CIA, to complain about its activities, to expose its corruption. And, and the record is clear. We're talking about an organization that has been responsible for 300,000 deaths by their own records, by the, the Senate's own records, 300,000 deaths in the, in the third world. Uh, and that's, that's a modest figure. I gave that figure myself in Senate testimony, and the next morning, Cy Hirsch, uh, I was playing tennis with him, and he, he, he said, Stockwell, you're all wet. He said, the figure's over 500,000. You forgot Indonesia. Mm. Now, that's what they've been doing out in the world. And of course, in the mood of these times, there are a lot of Americans who, who would just as soon melt Africa or Asia or wherever. They really could care less. But they have been doing things in the United States that you would, you know, strange lovey kind of things that you would only accredit to the Gestapo or the KGB at their worst. The mind and drug control. The mind MK Ultra, extensive over years, experimenting with unwitting Americans. By, by dropping them LSD and then filming their activities under the influence of drugs they didn't know they had received. As well as infiltrating political groups and spying on Americans, which were against the CIA charter. It was not supposed to be oh, domestically clearly. involved. And Carter put some guidelines regulating domestic activity of the CIA, and Reagan has signed an executive order putting these aside. Putting these aside. In effect, unleashing the CIA domestically Un so that any political group can be, or any individual could be the yeah. target of a CIA operation. So this is uh, another threat to our civil liberties here in the country. For sure, and they're defining who the targets are. They don't have to even go to a judge and say, we think this person's a target. They decide who a target is. And secrecy, as I've said before, and, and uh, many other people have said, including some, some leading senators, secrecy is primarily designed to cover up their misdeeds. Only in, in the very rare, most internal sensitive cases is secrecy a matter of national security. Yes, diplomacy at a certain point, you need some secrecy to negotiate some things. At a certain point, some military operations have to be secret to work. But, you know, we're talking about a tenth of a percent as compared to everything that is, in fact, uh, being declared secret. What they're trying to cover up is the wars, the killings, the drug experimentation, and the corruption.